Okay, you guys, I'm sorry I cut that video off abruptly because the guy that's working on my house started making a horrendous noise. So I believe the last thing I said was um, I was talking about reabsorption, which is the transport of anything dissolved in the filtrate. <clears throat> so like in this first part, this proximal tubule, about 100% of our nutrients get reabsorbed. So reabsorption is from the tube into the blood back into the peritubular capillaries. You see we reabsorb water here from the descending limb of the loop of Henle into the vasorecta. We um, reabsorb certain um, ions here. We reabsorb sodium and some other stuff here. And we reabsorb primarily water here. So reabsorption is always from the tube the renal tube you will into the blood supply the opposite of that is secretion so secretion would be from the blood into the tube so these would be things that like they didn't filter they're proteins this is the main way we excrete toxins and drugs is from the blood into the tube secretion it's blood tube blood tube so those are the three the three made ones filtration glomerulus to bowman's capsule Reabsorption, tube to blood, secretion, blood to tube, and then finally excretion is whatever's la whatever exits the collecting duct and moves into the um, renal pelvis. So again, here's just another version of the same picture. It's all abbreviated, but you can see a nice picture of the glomerulus. Big things stay in, little things filter. So this is filtration. Reabsorption would be tube to blood. Imagine there's a blood vessel right here. Secretion would be blood to tube, and excretion is whatever is at the end of the collecting duct. So be sure to understand that what those four terms mean if you don't remember that from physiology. Here's another nice picture of the glomerulus, the afferent and the efferent arteriole. Right, You can see big things staying in, and then the, this is kind of how the glomerular capsule kind of envelops the glomerulus, right? Kind of sort of like if you imagine like punching your fist into a balloon and how that kind of goes around. Um, so the small stuff becomes what we refer to as the glomerular ultrafiltrate. Really small stuff, water, ions, glucose, those sorts of things. Big things like proteins, red blood cells, white blood cells, they don't filter. They're way too big. Here's another nice picture of this would be inside of the tube. These are the cuboidal cells that line the renal tubules. You probably remember that from anatomy. Maybe, maybe not. The apical membrane is the one that faces inside of the tube. The basement membrane is the one on the outside, which interfaces with the wall of the capillary. So you can see how, how close these two, inside of the tube versus the inside of the capillaries are, are in proximity, right? There's just one cell, basically two cells, two cell thicknesses, a cuboidal cell making up the renal tubule and an endothelial cell. So the direction of reabsorption would be this way. Secretion would be this way. Most a lot of the secretion is actively is a lot of things that are secreted are secreted actively. So you see a lot of active transport pumps. It's expensive to do this energetically, so you see all kinds of mitochondria in there. All right, so this picture is in your book. It's sort of a schematic of the renal tubule or the nephron. Um, of course, all the, a lot of the detail is missing, and it's not anatomically anatomically correct, but it gives us a good idea. My suggestion for you for this unit would be to draw something like this on a piece of 8 by 11 paper and kind of fill in all the important things that happens in each of these locations, including when we get to the diuretics, where the diuretics act. It makes a lot of sense if you kind of like put it all together in this sort of a view. All right, so we're starting here. This would be, this is representing the Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. This is the proximal tubule. So 100% of our nutrients are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Most of what we reabsorb, we reabsorb in the proximal tubule. Um, the reabsorption of sodium in the proximal tubule requires an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, which is almost always around. When sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, it's, it's co-transported with either a chlorine, chloride, I don't know why you can't see that in color, it's supposed to be color, or a bicarbonate. So you would put Cl minus or a bicarbonate. Let's see if I can read this here. This is going to be hard because I am kind of retarded when it comes to using my left, my right, my left-handed and I'm using my right hand. So there's chloride, 
and bicarbonate. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's ugly. All right, this is negative and negative. Okay, so with the help of this enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, um, we have the reabsorption of sodium chloride or sodium bicarbonate. It sort of depends on what's going on. One of the very important jobs of the kidneys is to be able to help to maintain our pH balance, as I'm sure you remember. And so the bicarbonate is one of the players in that, right? If somebody's blood is too acidic, we could reabsorb preferentially sodium bicarbonate, and the bicarb would, um, the bicarbonate would uh, uh, alkalinize the blood a little bit. All right, then we've got our loop of Henle. We're not going to really talk too much about the loop um, at this point. Uh, they're mostly in this class. We're not going to talk about it too much because there aren't really. Uh, well, that's not true. There are drugs that act on it, but the drugs that act act at the top of the loop of Henle. And at the top of the loop of Henley, we have a very powerful reabsorption of chloride. It's kind of this like, um, uh, it's kind of a counter transport. Sodium and chloride and calcium actually all go here. Let's just see a picture of that later. In the distal tubule, you have the action of aldosterone, which comes from the adrenal glands. Uh, it's a mineral corticoid. It comes from the adrenal cortex, as I'm sure you recall. And what aldosterone does is it allows us to reabsorb sodium and secrete potassium or hydrogen. And that, that's not exactly a, a, a total truth. At the beginning part of the distal tubule, sodium is reabsorbed and potassium is secreted. Towards the end of the distal tubule, sodium gets reabsorbed and hydrogen ion gets secreted. Most of the secretion is gonna be of potassium, um, but again, the secretion of hydrogen will play a role in acid base. So we do secrete both, um, both potassium and hydrogen at the distal tubule under the influence of aldosterone, but we secrete a little bit more potassium than we do hydrogen. And the reason for that is because, you know, the, our pH is the most tightly regulated variable we have. Potassium is also quite tightly regulated, but not quite as tightly regulated as the pH. So we reabsorb a lot of sodium, right? Sodium reabsorption is a big part of what's going on in the renal tubules. And, and in this location, it has to be counter-transported. So it's gotta, there's got to be an exchange, a positive for a positive. So when we reabsorb a sodium, a positively charged ion, we have to secrete either potassium or hydrogen, also positively charged to keep all of our, to keep our, you know, our, our uh, overall um, charges balanced, if you will, keep that whole electroneutrality thing going. All right, and then the very end is the collecting duct. This is where antidiuretic hormone acts, which comes from the pituitary gland. And this is one of the only places in the, in the renal tubule where water is transported independently of sodium. Everywhere else where sodium is being transported, so where sodium is reabsorbed, water will follow it. But in the collecting duct, water can be um, reabsorbed under the influence of antidiuretic hormone independently of sodium. So that's something to remember. So when water is reabsorbed, it dilutes the blood, right? And, and concentrates the urine. All right, so let's really quickly talk about aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. I'm sure you remember this, but we're gonna talk about it because of the interrelationship between aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone and sodium, potassium, and hydrogen ion in the distal tubule, and then kind of think a little bit about um, acid base and fluid imbalances. So here's another picture of, this is a little bit more anatomically correct. In this picture, we have the glomerulus, we have the afferent arterial, and then you see, see how the distal tubule kind of wedges in between the afferent and the efferent arterial. So it kind of wedges in there and they kind of butt up against one another in that location with that, between these walls, which is that spot right there. And that's called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, if you recall. One of the things that gets secreted from the juxtaglomerular apparatus is renin, right? These little cells in here are sensitive to stretch. And when blood pressure is low, they sense that, and then renin, which is an enzyme, gets secreted. So that kicks off the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, or the RAA system, which I'm sure you've learned about ad nauseum in um, physiology. 
So again, the stimulus for the normal stimulus for the release of renin is low blood pressure, which gets detected in the afferent arterial. It actually gets detected by those cells kind of in between those two tubes, the afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule. And renin gets released into the blood. Renin is an enzyme, ultimately leads to the, the conversion of angiotensinogen, which is a plasma protein, into angiotensin, angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 2, which then angiotensin does um, increases blood pressure in two different ways. Remember, this is this is homeostasis. So the the stimulus was low blood pressure. So we're trying to get the blood pressure up. So one thing angiotensin does is it's a big time vasoconstrictor. It constricts vessels like crazy. The other thing it does is it it causes the release of aldosterone. So it's renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. Aldosterone, which of course again comes from the um, adrenal glands, the top of the adrenal gland. And aldosterone is a mineral corticoid and it acts on the distal tubule. We just said this. Aldosterone acts on the distal tubule. And at the distal tubule, when aldosterone is present, sodium is reabsorbed in exchange for either potassium, preferentially potassium, and hydrogen. Mostly potassium, but also some hydrogen. Okay, so what we've seen here is sodium is being reabsorbed, potassium and hydrogen potentially are being secreted in response to the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone. Under normal circumstances, renin gets released when the blood pressure is low. Renin also gets released under sympathetic stimulation. I think we might have talked about that earlier. And, and it turns out that it seems like some people actually just release more renin, probably because they're kind of sympathetic dominant, like most of us are in this day and age. So that's renin. So we have to kind of, I'm sort of alluded to this, and I don't want to get too crazy with this right now because it's not super important for our class, but remember that hydrogen is linked to other positive ions, and the one that it's most oftentimes linked to is potassium. So when we start to really appreciate the kidneys, which the kidneys are super complex, I think. I, I find the kidneys to be one of the hardest things to learn in physiology. There's just because there's so many things going on. So like we get rid of wastes, right? That if we all get, we all kind of understand that. But there's all sorts of other things the kidneys are doing. They're maintaining our blood, um, monitoring our blood, our body fluids for electrolytes. They're maintaining our pH. They're doing all sorts of things. Um, and one of the things that we have to think about is this this relationship between these positive these uh, these ions, right? So hydrogen is linked to other positively charged ions, especially potassium. Um, and so one of the things we know is potassium is generally found in higher concentrations inside of the cell. But if we come into a situation where we've got a lot of hydrogen outside of our cell, meaning that we have a lot of we have we're acidic, someone's experiencing acidosis, what the body needs to do, right? Because the um, pH is very tightly regulated. So when someone's acidic, the body is going to do anything it possibly can to get that hydrogen out of the blood. Remember, that's what pH is. It's a direct measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. So if you've got a bunch of hydrogen ions in your blood, we need to get it out of there, get them out of there. So one of the things that we do is we start stuffing it wherever we can. So you stuff hydrogen into the, our cells. When hydrogen goes into our cells, positively char charged ion goes in, we got to dump something positively charged to maintain electroneutrality. So potassium tends to come out. The other place where hydrogen is dealt with is in the um, is in the distal tubule, right? So another place we can get rid of hydrogen is we could, if somebody does have acidosis, when we get when the um, filtrate gets to the distal tubule, when we reabsorb sodium, rather than dis, than secreting uh, potassium preferentially, we could secrete hydrogen, right? So. Um, that's something to think about. On, in the, on the bottom there, it says, why would potassium depletion cause a systemic alkalosis? So I said earlier that potassium is also tight, very tightly regulated. So if somebody actually is experiencing a potassium depletion, right, they've lost potassium for reasons um, that are could be drug-related, um, they could have diarrhea, uh, that's a good way to lose potassium. Um, but anyway, for whatever reason, if somebody's potassium depleted, why would that cause a systemic alkalosis? And the reason for that 
I give you a second to think about that. Why would potassium depletion cause a systemic alkalosis? So when somebody is pota has potassium depletion, they can't dump more potassium out here, right? They're already low on potassium. So instead, we'd start dumping, when we reabsorb sodium under the influence of aldosterone, we'd start dumping preferentially hydrogen. So when you take hydrogen out of your blood in higher concentration than you normally would, your blood pH is going to become, is going to increase, right? So you're going to move towards this state of alkalosis. So there's lots of things to think about here. And again, this is one of those things that you kind of have to think about a little bit over and over and over again. And when it clicks, it will click and it'll make a lot of sense. But if it's been a while since you thought about pH and what that's all about and the kidneys, you might have to think about this for a few more minutes. All right, we'll come back to that a little bit. All right, so the collecting tubule, again, this is where antidiuretic hormone acts. The collecting tubule is the location where we can see water transport independently of sodium. ADH, of course, stands for antidiuretic hormone. I just said this, where is it produced? It's produced from the posterior pituitary. It's one of two. The other hormone from the posterior pituitary is oxytocin. Um, what stimulates the production or the release of antidiuretic hormone? Dehydration is one. Um, thirst is another. Um, if your blood is too concentrated in the hypothalamus, usually that's because you're dehydrated. Um, and if someone's thirsty, it's usually because they're dehydrated. So it's a measure of the blood being too concentrated. When the blood is too concentrated, that will get picked up in the hypothalamus. Antidiuretic hormone is released. It travels through the blood. It acts on the collecting tubule, and it causes us to reabsorb a bunch of water from the collecting duct. Um, the other thing that might stimulate this, I mentioned it already, is thirst. So that's antidiuretic hormone. Here's the location where antidiuretic hormone acts. Right here you see water moving on its own. So antidiuretic hormone actually causes little water channels called aquaporins, if you recall, to get inserted in the collecting duct. And when the and, and the other thing that I haven't talked about because I haven't really wanted to get into it, but I will mention it is, so this is the, up here at the top is the cortex of the kidneys. Down here is the medulla, the outer medulla, then deep in the inner medulla, right at the tips of the renal pyramids. If you recall the interstitial tissue, the interstitial fluid in the renal medulla is super concentrated. Look at here, 1400 milliosmoles, as opposed to, you know, somewhere around 300 in the renal cortex. So there, this is super concentrated. So if you pop little holes in this, water is going to rush like crazy because remember, wa osmosis, water always moves towards the high solute concentration, which is out here. It's a bunch of solutes of water. This is the kind of the force that pulls the water across. And then what's not shown here, but should be, is a little blood vessel and the water just goes bleep right in there. And then we dilute the blood. All right. So when the blood is too concentrated, we just talked about this, more antidiuretic hormone is released. The collecting duct is more permeable. More water is re reabsorbed, which means the urine becomes more concentrated and the blood is more dilute. When the blood is too dilute to start with, less antidiuretic hormone is released. Same thing, the hypothalamus would pick that up, say, wow, there's way too much water in here, but it's way too dilute. Less antidiuretic hormone is released, which means the collecting duct remains less permeable. The water stays in the renal tubule. Less water is reabsorbed into the blood. The urine becomes less concentrated or more dilute, and the blood then over time would become more concentrated. And there's an, our picture again. I don't know why I put that twice. Then there's this thing called the syndrome of inappropriate ADH or SIDH. And it is exactly what it sounds like, the inappropriate secretion of ADH. Too much ADH is being secreted independently of what's going on with the concentration of the blood. This can be due to a tumor of the posterior pituitary. That's quite common. This could do, be due to a tumor in other parts of the body. The lungs are kind of notable for this. Sometimes stress, specifically stretch, like a big stressful um, experience, including, including surgical stress, right? That's a big stress on the body. Um, stress can do it. It's not uncommon after pregnancy, which is also very stressful for the body, for women to develop syndrome of inappropriate ADH. And when this happens, 
so they're secreting antidiuretic hormone more than they should, so their blood is going to become really dilute. And the danger here is when the blood becomes really dilute, what will ultimately end up happening is the water will move into the blood, so the extracellular fluid volume becomes more dilute, and then ultimately when the, when the inside of the cells are more concentrated relative to the outside of the cells, normally they're the same concentration, the intracellular fluid is 300 milliosmoles, the extracellular fluid is 300 milliosmoles, so they're the same concentration. When the extracellular fluid becomes way more dilute, the inside of the cell remains too concentrated, the water will rush inside of the cell and cause those cells to swell, potentially um, uh, bursting. Where it really becomes an issue is in the brain because the brain doesn't have anywhere to go, right? It's encased in that bony box and therefore um, they can end up with uh, convulsions, seizures, and can actually die as a result. All right, so I want to talk to you for a minute about acid-base imbalances. Um, here's the dog. Say hi. <laughs> okay. Um, so acid-base imbalances. I shouldn't have done that. Um, okay, so this can be a longer conversation than I really want it to be. So. If you remember from physiology, you really have two body systems. Really, there's, th there's three lines of defense, if you will, in terms of maintaining pH. First is the bicarbonate blood, the buffering system of the blood, the bi sodium bicarbonate. Then we've got the lungs, the, or the respiratory system, and then we have the kidneys. So the bicarbonate buffering system, you've got the respiratory component, which is essentially carbon dioxide and water. You've got the renal c component, which is basically bicarbonate. And we kind of toggle back and forth between the respiratory component and the renal component. The thing to remember is that if the blood pH swings at all, that means your buffering systems are not are saturated, right? The buffering, the buff, the blood won't change if the buffers are working. So then we rely on the um, then we rely on the uh, lungs, sorry, the lungs and the kidneys. I'm going to go back for a second. I was, so I want you to recall um, that we have two places in the renal tubule that we're going to ultimately look to for, for helping us with pH. One is right here. And again, I don't know why you can't see this because it's here. You can see it in your picture. Um, here you have uh, bicarbonate. H C O three. Oh, that's terrible. And chloride. They're negative. And then we have potassium and hydrogen. Oh, it's like hieroglyphics. All right, so this is one place where we have some play in terms of acid base balance, and here's the other. So one thing I would like you to notice is the direction of the arrows. So the only thing we can do with bicarbonate is reabsorb it. We cannot secrete bicarbonate into the renal tubule. We make it in the renal tubule, but we cannot secrete it. So the only option we have for the bicarbonate is to reabsorb bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a base. When you reabsorb bicarbonate, it's going to bring the pH up. So it's going to help you to correct for an acidosis. If somebody is already alkaline, we would not want to reabsorb bicarbonate. Instead, we'd want to grab all the chloride we can. The other option is over here, and look at the direction of the arrow. Our option here is to secrete hydrogen ion. We cannot reabsorb hydrogen ion in the renal tubule, but we can secrete it. So again, if someone's blood is too acidic, we could dump hydrogen ion here, in which case we would hold on to the potassium, and the potassium levels might get too high. If somebody's blood is alkaline, um, we would not want to get rid of the hydrogen. Instead, we would secrete potassium and hold on to the hydrogen, potentially maybe depleting the blood of potassium. So this is not like a, a, a end game kind of fix. It's sort of supposed to be. It, the kidneys are pretty good at maintaining pH, but you gotta, you gotta remove the thing that's causing the pH to, to swing. All right, so to correct for an alkalosis, remember the lungs have the lungs get on board first, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this because this is not um, the, our unit. But basically, all the lungs can do is they can um, play around with the carbon dioxide levels. So if someone is alkaline, that means that their blood pH is high, too high, greater than the body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So anything above 7.45 is considered alkaline. 
So what's happening here, if to correct, the, what the respiratory system would do is we try to hold on to the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will also ultimately disassociate into bicarbonate and then hydrogen ion. Um, or carbonic acid, pardon me, and then hydrogen ion. So what you would see in the respiratory system is a decrease in respiratory rate to hold on to the carbon dioxide. The kidney is what we care about, so here we are. If someone's alkaline, that means their pH is high. So would we want to reabsorb bicarbonate in the proximal tubule? No way. That would make it worse. So we block the reabsorption of bicarbonate, and with our sodium, we're going to reabsorb chloride. And when we get to the distal tubule, do we want to get rid of the hydrogen ion? No, we want to hold on to that hydrogen ion. So we'd retain hydrogen, and instead, we'd preferentially secrete um, more potassium. Could that mess up the blood levels of potassium? Yes, in which case it would cause what we cause what we would call a hypokalemia. K with a K, like they have the potassium there, kalemia. All right, to correct for an acidosis respiratory system, now we want to get rid of that CO2, blow it off. So we're going to hyperventilate like crazy. By hyperventilating, you blow off the CO2, which means you're going to deplete the blood of hydrogen ion, which is what we're trying for. If we can't correct it with that, and of course we're kind of limited by this, um, then what we can do is A, in the proximal tubule with our sodium reabsorption, as, in the, as long as you've got carbonic anhydrase, we are going to reabsorb sodium bicarbonate. Leave the chloride in the tube. And when we get to the distal tubule, when aldosterone is present, we're going to reabsorb sodium and secrete preferentially hydrogen ion, leaving the potassium in the tube. Can that mess up your blood levels of potassium? You bet you can. And that would call it... Call, call, <laughs> cause what we call hyperkalemia. So if none of that made any sense to you, you might want to stop your video right now and kind of think about that for a second. Something to remember about the kidneys, you got to kind of keep in mind that the kidneys are good at um, fixing or kind of correcting acid-base imbalances. Fixing is kind of too big of a word, but alleviating the burden of the acid-base imbalance if the cause is from another source, meaning that the kidneys aren't the source of the problem. If your kidneys are the source of your problem, you're kind of screwed when it comes to acid-base balance because the kidneys are the best, right? They take the longest to kind of get on board, but they do the best at maintaining a pH. And if your kidneys are the source of the problem, you're going to have a really hard time maintaining your blood pH. So some examples of reasons, places, uh, uh, circumstances where the kidneys can be helpful would be if they have alkalosis because they've been hyperventilating, if they've been vomiting, um, if they have uh, acidosis because they have been losing um, potassium, they have had diarrhea, they have excess last lactic acid, they have respiratory insufficiency, um, they have diabetes, very good, easy way to get acidosis. So. In those cases, as long as the kidneys aren't the immediate source of the issue, the kidneys can really help. But if the kidneys are the source of the problem, then it's going to be a lot more difficult to correct for it. All right, so to correct for an acid-base imbalance. If someone has acidosis, we're going to give them some kind of base. Usually it's sodium bicarbonate. If somebody has alkalosis, we're going to give them some kind of acid. Ammonium chloride is one of the ones that we do. Um, Okay, so we're going to kind of, we're, we're not going to talk about diuretics yet. We're going to talk about diuretics in the next video, but I want you to think about um, edema for a second. So edema is when you've got swelling in a place where it shouldn't be, right? Water is trapped somewhere there it should, that it shouldn't be. There's lots and lots of causes for edema. One really good way to get edema is heart failure. The blood congests, it backs up, and it ultimately backs up from the right side of the, the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart, and then systemically. Um, acute pulmonary edema, same kind of a thing, but the issue here is the it's going to start in the lungs and back up to the right side of the heart and then systemically. Liver disease, cirrhosis, any other kind of portal obstruction, hepatitis, those sorts of things, backs up into the portal circulatory system. The blood can't move forward, and so it congests, and they get a lot of edema. Um, they get the edema in the belly, which we call ascites. Um, the, oftentimes, if the liver is really damaged, uh, they cannot make adequate amounts of plasma proteins.
And remember, protein, plasma proteins are the force that keeps your water in your blood vessels. So if you don't have adequate plasma proteins, the water starts leaking out of your blood vessels and it starts to settle in other places. So if someone has a lack of plasma protein, they're going to have a lot of edema. Kidney disease, it's a good way to get a lot of edema as long as the kidneys are still functioning. Pregnancy, right? Pregnant women have a lot of blood, double the blood volume, so it's not uncommon for pregnant women to get edema. Um, you got to be kind of cautious with giving pregnant women diuretics, um, but that's something that we might do. We'll talk about that later on. All right, so what we are going to be doing is we're going to be looking at diuretics. We're going to identify the electrolyte and acid base imbalances that might occur. And the easy thing is the same kind of electrolyte and acid base imbalances are going to occur. It's just that they're going to be more likely with certain diuretics than others. All right, so the first ones I want to talk about, and these are not potent diuretics, but these are referred to as osmotic diuretics. So remember the term osmosis is always dealing with water. So osmotic diuretics osmotically hold water to increase the urine volume. So an example of an osmotic diuretic would be mannitol. It's a sugar that gets essentially lands in the, you know, gets administered. It ends up not being absorbed. So it ends up filtering. It, it lands in your renal tubules and then it pulls water into the renal tubule. So it increases your urine volume. And so this is a good way to um, just keep fluid flowing through the nephrons. And it's always really important that fluid flows through our nephrons. If they don't have fluid flowing through them, they'll become necrotic and they'll dry up and die, essentially. So we always want to make sure that we have fluid flowing through them. So osmotic diuretics are going to do this. They might lose a little bit of sodium along with it, but it's not that big of a deal. So the main reasons for osmotic diuretics, and again, these are not super potent diuretics, but they're really good for maintaining urine volume in situations where they might not be getting adequate blood flow to the kidneys, like they have shock or they've had some poisoning. Um, if the kidneys aren't adequately functioning and you're just trying to run, make sure you're getting fluid running through there, that's a good thing as well. They don't really do much for edema because they aren't really able to correct for what's going on. They're just, you're just flushing essentially. So they're not going to be super helpful for edema. Um, they are okay at moving fluid from one compartment to the next, like just drawing it for out of like one compartment and moving it into another. So if someone has like um, swelling of extra water on the brain, osmotic diuretics would be a good uh, option here. Or if they have extra water in their eye, that would be another option where you can just move it from one place to another, but not if they have edema, right? All right. Um, so another way you can get more blood into the kidneys is to increase glomerular filtration rate. And one of the ways we do that is vasodilate the afferent arteriole. But this is not the way that the main mechanism of action of diuretics. Um, this might happen if you give an, a drug for another reason that causes vasodilation, you might get this, but this is not, this is not an action of diuretics. So drugs like xanthines, right, caffeine, for example, um, is a vasodilator and it makes people urinate more because it pulling, but it basically because it's increasing glomerular filtration rate. Um, Okay, so we don't really need to spend any time talking about that because those are not important. So all diuretics work via this mechanism and they all inhibit ion reabsorption, right? And the ion that they're, the primary ion that's going to be inhibited is sodium, although other, the other ions oftentimes are uh, reabsorption are also inhibited. So directly or indirectly, they're gonna inhibit the, act, the, the um, reabsorption of sodium chloride, bicarbonate, depending on where which diuretic that we are talking about. All of them are going to re re result in a decreased sodium ion reabsorption. And remember I said earlier that water, with the exception of the collecting duct, water follows the sodium. So the diuresis that we see is a result of the water staying with the sodium and the sto sodium staying in the renal tubule because it is the sum of its reabsorption has been blocked. So I'm going to say that again. All diuretics, either directly or indirectly, inhibit the reabsorption of sodium ion. And in so doing, 
they keep water with the sodium in the tube. So the, re the sodium stays in the tube, the water stays with it, the sodium gets lost, the water goes with it, and that's the diuresis. So if you think back to what you know about the intracellular and the extracellular compartment, what do you think regulates fluid movement between the intracellular and the extracellular compartments? It's the same thing. It's the sodium-potassium pump. Meta cellular metabolism and the sodium-potassium pump. Cellular metabolism meaning you because it's you need ATP to run that sodium-potassium pump, right? It's, it's an ATP-dependent process. Sodium comes in with depolarization, potassium leaves, and then we have to pump the sodium out and the potassium back in, and the water is going to follow. Water always follows the ions. All right, so I want to talk to you about um, a, 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 a diuretic that, again, is not, well, two, two diuretics, but the first one is not a potent diuretic, not commonly used. Um, but they act at the proximal tubule, and what they do is they inhibit the reabsorption of bicarbonate at the proximal tubule and sodium at the proximal tubule, because remember, sodium and bicarb go together. So examples of this are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and the thiazides, um, both of which are sulfonamide derivatives. So you have to kind of be aware of people with sulfa sensitivities. People that are um, sensitive to sulfa drugs are going to be sensitive potentially to both of these. So these drugs are going to inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and bicarbonate in the proximal tubule. So when that happens so 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 you so one of the things you kind of have to keep in track of where you are in the tubule so in the we're talking about the first part so now what i'm saying is we have more sodium in the proximal tubule if someone's taking a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor the thiazides are a little bit different because they act both on the proximal tubule but just minorly but they also act at the top of the um Distal, the beginning of the distal, top of the loop of Henle, beginning of the distal tubule, and that's where they have a little bit more potent action. So um, the sodium enters the distal, so sodium reabsorption is inhibited at the proximal tubule, which means more sodium stays in the tube. When that sodium heavy filtrate lands in the distal convoluted tubule, the body's going to pull that sodium out, right? There's a little more sodium there than normal. And when it does, it's going to secrete potassium. So there's a chance, although it's minimal, that carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can cause a little bit of potassium depletion from the blood. It's not very likely, but it's possible. Um, okay, but if that is the case, um, we can um, we can see a little bit of acid base imbalance as well, and the tendency here would be because we're reabsorbing um, because we're inhibiting the reabsorption of um, uh, sodium at the proximal tubule uh, and bicarbonate. Um, we might see a little bit of alkalosis potentially. That's not a big deal though. We're going to talk about the diuretics a little bit more clearly in the next video. Um, so at the top of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, there are drugs that act there. Thiazides, the ones that I just said that act a little bit on the proximal tubule, a little bit at the top of the loop. But then the main drugs that act on the top of the loop are really powerful um, diuretics called the loop drugs. Ferrosamide or Lasix is one, ethacrinic acid, bumetidide, and terosamide. Those are all loop diuretics. So the thiazides do act there to some extent, but the ones that really are going to have a very um, pronounced effect are those loop drugs there. So at the top of the loop of Henle, we reabsorb somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20% of our sodium. So the loop drugs block that inhibit that reabsorption of it's a it's kind of like a crazy transporter. Chloride, sodium, and calcium actually all three go together. Um, so by blocking that transporter, you're going to block the reabsorption of chl chloride and sodium, and it's a lot of sodium. That sodium that would be reabsorbed at the top of the loop, then all is going to get dumped into the distal tubule. And we're going to try to 
under the influence of aldosterone, we're going to try to bring that sodium, reabsorb that sodium, right? So we don't lose it all and um, start dumping potassium, dumping hydrogen like crazy. So there's a real good chance that the extra sodium that lands in the distal tubule will cause potassium depletion and potentially hydrogen secretion as well. And when we secrete hydrogen, we're making the blood more alkaline. Okay, we'll come back to those. The drugs acting on the distal convoluted tubule are called the potassium sparing diuretics. They're usually pretty weak on their own, but um, they are used mostly to sort of counter the side effects that are produced with the loop drugs. So there's a couple different ones. Um, one is called spironolactone. Spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist. So it antagonizes the actions of aldosterone. It only works if you've got a lot of aldosterone around. So what it's going to do if it's if, uh, in acting on the distal tubule is it's going to block sodium reabsorption and potassium secretion, causing um, diuresis and potassium retention, so hyperkalemia in the blood. There's other, another drug that acts directly on the tubule independently of spironolactone, and um, those are called ald are are called um what are those called i'm forgetting right now oh the the brand names are triamptrine and amiloride um but they 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 block the receptor the aldosterone receptor but they don't actually antagonize the action of, al of aldosterone so for the most part they're all they're about the same now again these drugs on their own the potassium sparing di diuretics on their own really are weak in terms of diuresis but they do help to manage the side effects that are created with those loop drugs. So we'll come back to that. All right, so that's a primer. So I would suggest if you're totally confused at this point to rewind, review a little bit of your physiology, and then come back to catch the diuretics in the next lecture.